Finally, we turn to my own area of research. I study a particular kind of speech and language or languaging. Um, and it is understudied, it must be said. Most approaches to speech and language have treated speech and language as if it was all about passing messages. And this makes perfect sense in a view in which minds are singular, discrete, in other words, in the Cartesian legacy. It's very useful for some purposes, and we wouldn't have speech and language technology, we wouldn't have text, print, the internet, if we didn't. Um, have a great facility at message passing, but that does not at all exhaust language. Notice that when we speak of language as if it was just the communication of messages, we don't really care much whether we're using the voice or using text or using smoke signals or sign language. So it seems to me that given what we said before, that for the vast period of time in which humans were becoming modern humans and in which language emerged, there was no writing, there were no texts, and all communication was vocal. And furthermore, there wasn't a distinction between what we now think of as linguistic elements and non-linguistic elements. In 20th century linguistics, both the first half in structuralism and the second half in generative linguistics, there's been an emphasis on systems, abstract systems, assumed to underlie the messy business of everyday language use. So Saussure, the structuralist, uh, emphasized langue, which is a hypothetical abstract structure, and not parole, which is messy business of words and speaking. Chomsky also had a, not quite the same distinction, but a, a slightly different one, but it also distinguished between competence, which is the presumed abstract systematic skill you have in stringing together sentences, and performance, which is this messy business where we don't actually speak in full sentences and we constantly make errors, as it were. Um, both of them, in other words, abstracted away from the voice and the body and the context in order to focus on those elements that could be defined contrastively and thereby allow symbolic communication. Both of them treated the medium of language as basically irrelevant. It doesn't really matter much whether it's speaking or writing, but we have done our historical review. and We know that the voice is far, far older than writing, so that this kind of orthodox arrangement of the subdisciplines of linguistics is something that we might want to question. Semantic syntax, morphology and phonology provide us a means of discussing symbolic communication, but they don't clearly delineate language if we want to understand that in a broader sense. So what's been left out? Well, the body. If we abstract away in this fashion, then we remove any reference to gesture, pointing, gaze, posture. The gaze and even blinking are a fundamental part of face-to-face -face communication. And remember, when we're trying to understand what happened to our species, we must take face-to-face -face communication as our default, for that is the way in which humans almost always communicated. In a given conversation, there will be lots of things that would never make it onto the page if we were writing. So back channels where we say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, they're very important in conversation. And the signals of mutual involvement, the way we turn towards each other, the way we gaze at or not at each other, all that gets lost when we abstract away into this abstract systemic notion of language. And the biggest thing that gets lost is the context in which languaging happens. Language is always situated in a given context. And usually what we utter can only be understood if we know something about the context in which it's uttered. So all this sort of gets tossed overboard. Um, in my home discipline of phonetics, emphasis has switched in the last 20 years, I would say, where for the previous 40 years, phoneticians had sought the ghost of letters in speech, looking to isolate uh, those contrastive elements that also find representation in writing. We've changed, and now we look far more at the sort of musical elements of the voice, the rhythms and the intonation, the tone of voice, the emphasis patterns, 
Um, this is sort of was treated as a miscellaneous category just because it didn't fit the systemic organization of language, but more and more we see it as a really, really important central part of speech, but it resists this kind of reduction to symbolic opposition. And if that wasn't enough, there's one form of speaking that has been neglected almost entirely. I built my work around it. I call it joint speech. It's kind of remarkable. I had to name this simply because the science of it doesn't exist. Here's the definition. When multiple people utter the same thing at the same time, we have an example of joint speech. So, for example, this is what we'll find in prayer when we say the decades of the rosary. There is a call and response structure to the rosary. It's a very delicate structure, very important formal characteristics. But basically, it's one of those many occasions, as are an awful lot of prayer and ritual occasions, where people utter the same thing at the same time. And with that, we can use this simple definition to pick out domains of human activity and to pay attention to context. So prayer and ritual have played a foundational role in all human societies. They're part of what makes us human. But we find the same form of speech, multiple people uttering the same thing at the same time at the moment in protest demonstrations all over the world. It's the vernacular of protest. We chant and chant again. The English word chant, incidentally, is nicely ambiguous about whether it belongs to speech or song. There are sung chants and spoken chants. And in joint speech, we find the distinction between music and speech goes away as well. A third domain that we pick out using this definition is sports fans. Now, what of the nuns of County Cork and the protesters of Black Lives Matter got to do with the enthusiasm of Liverpool fans? Well, they all use joint speech in order to collectively manifest their identity. So these are strange things to group together. And there's a, one last situation where we find joint speech throughout the world, and that's in primary education. See if you can figure out what's going on here. These children are in Laos. Can you guess? They're saying their times tables, just like you did. Chanting is used for a variety of purposes in the education of primary children the whole world over, even as very different educational models are brought to bear. So, joint speech directs us to specific contexts, and these contexts are at the center of highly valued practices and rituals in every human culture. Those who partake in such things accord them the very highest significance, and they all provide a way of, of enacting or bringing into being a collective identity and a collective subjectivity, a collective point of view, whether that be as a worshipper or as an Arsenal fan. And oddly enough, joint speech has been lacking as a topic of scientific inquiry. Um, I've sort of made it my life's mission to change that. Now, you may think that uh, was the past and you, you don't take part in any rituals because you're modern secular folk. Well, here's a little ritual that you definitely take part in. Thanks to you, happy birthday dear Tony. Happy birthday to you. The singing of happy birthday is a ritual. It's obligatory to take part. It would be very rude if people are singing happy birthday and you sit here like this, if you know the person. In fact, this compulsion to join in is so great that you may have found yourself joining in in a restaurant for people you don't even know. It's a means by which we collectively signify the importance of an individual. And it also illustrates this strange fact about joint speech, which is it's sort of musical-ish. Nobody goes home and puts on CDs of their favorite versions of Happy Birthday but it's not spoken either. So I find this rather weird. There's, a, there's another speech phenomenon that one could investigate, and that's speaking in tongues or glossolalia, which is indulged in by certain members of certain Pentecostal communities to great effect, great dramatic effect. And it may be a wonderful thing, I suspect it is. But oddly enough, there's 
Very few people do this, and you probably have not spoken in tongues, although I could be, could be wrong. Oddly enough, there is more than 10 times as much scientific literature on glossolalia or speaking in tongues as there is on joint speech. Isn't that strange? So joint speech raises questions that we're ill-equipped to deal with. Questions about joint intentions, shared subjectivity, um, and it's a participatory activity in which the identities that are so expressed are created and maintained in real time. And I'll have a video in the teaching resources that elaborates on joint speech some more. So to wrap up, the term language can be reified in various ways. Typically, it's used to pick out contrasting symbolic elements used in certain forms of communication, irrespective of whether it's vocal or written. That's one way to reify it. The word languaging alerts us to the fact that when we come at human language and we want to understand what happened to our species, we need to pay attention to a lot more things. We need to pay attention to the body, to the context in which the languaging occurs. We need to include the listener and we probably need to pay more attention to things like gestures and gaze. So we wrap up the topic of languaging there.